When time came for the 1927 Solvay Conference to be held in Brussels, it seemed that Heinrich Lorenz, the conference's elder statesman and convener, picked a topic designed to ignite the war that had been brewing for two years. The title of the conference, Electrons and Photons, was designed to allow the physicists invited to present and discuss the theories of the day and to do battle over the future of the atom and, perhaps, the very nature of physics itself. And from empires old and new they came to represent the differing sides that had become deeply entrenched. On one side, there was Bohr from Denmark, Heisenberg born from Göttingen, Pauli from Hamburg, Dirac from Cambridge, and Kramers from Utrecht. In the middle was Ehrenfest from Leiden, and on the other side was Einstein from Zurich, Schrödinger from Berlin, and de Broglie from Paris. The experimentalists weren't part of the debate directly, but they were represented by Curie from the Radium Institute, Wilson from the Cavendish, Langmuir from the United States, along with Arthur Compton from Washington University in St. Louis, who would win the Nobel Prize in Physics that year for his work in X-ray scattering, which showed conclusively the particle nature of light. What had started in 1925 as a ray of light to eliminate a path out of the sense of crisis that engulfed atomic physics had become a somewhat bitter debate between Heisenberg's matrix mechanics and the wave mechanics of Erwin Schrödinger. While the two approaches to describing the behavior of the electron in an atom had been shown to be equivalent in terms of the mathematics, there was a deep philosophical difference as to how the electron was to be understood between the two approaches. And at the fifth Solvay conference, the participants were determined to have it out to decide which interpretation would prevail. The 28 men and one woman who gathered in October of 1927 would arrive at an understanding of matter that is carried down to this day. Hello, and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 2, A History of the Atom. Episode 16, The Mechanical Atom, Part 2. To best understand how things had changed between late 1925, when Heisenberg, Born, and Jordan had published their three papers, and the showdown in Brussels in 1927, we need to start in Zurich with a man who had seemingly uncontroversial ideas about physics while holding decidedly unconventional ideas about personal relationships. By the way, as a side note here, why do I have this urge to use the language of boxing and promotion to describe this showdown to come? Should we find some catchy title like The Rumble in the Bronx or The Thrilla in Manila to refer to the Fifth Solvay Conference? The Battle in Brussels, maybe, or the Solvay Smackdown. Seems a bit unseemly, doesn't it? To talk about this like Heisenberg and Schrodinger are going to go bare knuckle at a podium in front of a chalkboard? Anyway, back to the narrative. Schrodinger's kind of an anomaly in the story, and in more ways than one. While I don't want to delve too deeply into his life here, as I hope to do a biographical supplement this coming week, Erwin Schrödinger didn't really fit the mold of the German Wunderkind. While he was the child of a reasonably well-to-do Austrian family with a bit of a background in academia, he wasn't the same kind of physics prodigy like many we've talked about. He certainly did well in his schooling, working up through the various ranks of the Austrian school system, but perhaps it was because he lost time serving in the Austro-Hungarian army on the Italian front in World War I that he really didn't make his mark. While his early career was that of a solid research scientist, he didn't make groundbreaking advances in his early to mid-twenties like the others had. Instead, he worked at a somewhat second-rate Austrian university whose best students, those like Wolfgang Pauli, left to follow opportunities in Germany or England. He worked in what Thomas Kuhn would call the practice of normal science, 
filling in the details in areas sketched out by more forward-thinking researchers. In the late 19-teens and the early 1920s, he had published the definitive summary of color theory up to that time and had written minor papers on the wave-particle nature of light and electron orbits that had secured him a position in the first-rate University of Zurich hierarchy in 1921. However, in 1925, at the age of 38, he felt like, perhaps, his best years had passed him by. Like so many others of the time, he suffered from chronic respiratory issues, most likely from tuberculosis, and would, on a regular basis, seek refuge in the higher mountain air of the Alps, whose low humidity and cool temperatures were generally thought to be effective in at least relieving the symptoms of his illness. Moreover, Schrodinger was something of a solitary worker. Unlike Bohr and Einstein, who needed someone to express ideas to, Erwin preferred to think alone, neither taking students nor cultivating collaborators in the vein of Max Born and his theoretical institute in Göttingen. So in the summer of 1925, after a particularly difficult episode of respiratory issues, he took to the alpine retreat of Arosa, taking along with him the thesis of Louis de Broglie to work through as well as an unknown mistress, who many historians suggest may have served as something of a muse for the physicist who might have been thought least likely to join a new scientific revolution. He had picked up de Broglie's work after reading a reference to it in a paper published by Einstein, and thought it might offer some insight into a few ideas that were bouncing around in his head. Schrodinger was a man deeply uncomfortable with many of the ideas contained in the old quantum mechanical model of the atom. More than anything, he disdained the notion of the discontinuous behavior of the electrons when they underwent the model's quantum jumps from one energy level to another. Like Einstein, with whom he shared a number of philosophical and behavioral tendencies, Schrodinger wanted to be able to think of space-time and an object's motion in it as being continuous. No discrete jumps from one level to another like Bohr and his group thought. Moreover, as he read de Broglie's thesis, he found he liked the description of an electron as some sort of matter wave that reinforced itself in an orbit. Sometime during his stay in the Alps, a picture based on de Broglie's waves crystallized in the mind of the Austrian physicist. When he returned to Zurich, he spent three weeks feverishly working out the details of his epiphany. The result, published in a series of five papers, was a wave mechanics formulation of quantum theory that, at least at first, seemed very different than the approach that had been taken by Heisenberg. The first paper spelled out the approach in clear, unambiguous terms. It gave the simplest form of what would come to be known as the Schrodinger equation, and then used it to derive the hydrogen atom. The second paper extended the formulation of the equation and applied the approach to solve three additional specific problems in a fairly simple and elegant way. The third paper then showed that the wave approach was equivalent, at least mathematically, to the matrix approach and then applied it to solve a problem the matrix method was having a great difficulty with. Finally, at least in our discussion, the fourth paper gave a third and final formulation of that fundamental equation that allowed the method to treat the problem of scattering, at least in some sense, and introduced for the first time a formulation of quantum mechanics that included complex numbers. A step once taken would lead quantum theory into a realm of mathematical specialization from which it would never return. The first difference between the two was in the mathematics. While matrix mechanics used what was, for physicists at the time anyway, an obscure branch of mathematics, wave mechanics used a familiar formulation, known as differential equations, to describe the electron's motion in the atom. If you've ever seen a rep representation of what's known as the Schrodinger equation, you know that it looks something like a regular algebraic equation. Well, okay, it's got a complex number thing going on, and there's the whole weird Greek letter psi, and a derivative or two, but it's not like you have to figure out how to multiply one strange table of numbers by another strange table of numbers in a very specific way with rules you've never seen before, right? 
this type of equation was very comfortable for many physicists because they sort of knew how to think about the things differential equations represented. The second difference between the two approaches was an ease of use. Matrix mechanics was a horribly complicated thing to work with. You know, I just sort of explained how hard it was to use. Wolfgang Pauli had worked really hard to just get the spectrum of the hydrogen atom using matrix mechanics. Schrodinger's method was a whole lot easier and it was able to solve problems that the matrix method didn't seem to be able to make much progress on. In this, the physicists of Europe found much to like in wave mechanics. It didn't require an enormous amount of work using new mathematical methods known only to a very small subset of theorists. One thing to understand is that prior to about 1920, physicists looked at mathematics like tools in a toolbox. There had been, for a number of years, some fretting about the idea that mathematics might take physics away from its roots of explaining the behavior of objects as they moved through space and interacted with each other. Today, such fears seem rather parochial, as even my lower division students learn the mathematical techniques used to work with matrices in a sophomore level course. But at the time, there was a real resistance on the part of many to having to learn a whole new branch of mathematics. The third difference, and it is difficult to overstate the importance of this, was that wave mechanics seemed to offer a way to physically interpret what was going on inside the atom. Matrix mechanics had explicitly rejected a physical description of the behavior of the electron as being unobservable. For Heisenberg, the atom was a black box out of which came data. His matrix method used the data he had to talk about transition probabilities without having to say how the transitions happened or even what they were. Wave mechanics offered a much more classical description of an electron moving through space or, by this point, due to the work of Einstein, something called space-time. It was really something a traditional physicist could hang his or her hat on and say, this is what was going on. This appealed very strongly to men like Einstein and Bohr, whose intuitive approach to physics started with working to understand the physical nature of reality and then finding a mathematical model that accurately described that reality. Schrodinger's first two papers were published, the small world of atomic physics was thrown back into crisis. Just when it seemed like there was a path out of the woods of the old quantum model, things were once again deeply confused. There were two models now, and there was a lot of consternation about which was correct. However, when Schrodinger published his third paper, showing the equivalence of the two methods, something also done by Pauli and Jordan, by the way, at about the same time, there was relief that no one had to try to choose between two fundamentally different mathematical frameworks. However, in the passing of the second crisis, a third one began to slowly build, one that was much deeper and more profound than an argument about mathematical technique. This third crisis was about how to actually think about the nature of reality and matter. And this is really the heart of things. There are times when the academic discussions of a scientific theory can seem esoteric at best and downright trivial at worst. But as is so often true, it was in the understanding of the details of what things actually meant that the really important work was going to be done. It turns out that the mathematics, the mechanics as it was and is still called, was only really technique. The important ideas were found in trying to understand how each formulation treated the stuff. We've already seen some of this in bits and pieces. Is light a particle or is it a wave? What about matter? Do electrons orbit and pass through space-time? Or are they waves? Or do we really even know what they are in relation to the nucleus of the atom? Is the behavior of matter and space-time continuous or discontinuous? Does it travel cleanly and smoothly from one place to another, or does it jump without having to travel in between the two points at all? While these would normally be seen as philosophical questions to be considered in the area of metaphysics, 
It was this small band of physicists who were trying to answer them with experimental data and mathematical techniques. So let's lay out the battle lines. On one side was Schrodinger with the support of Einstein and to a lesser degree, de Broglie. In a footnote to his final paper in the first half of 1926, he wrote, quote, my theory was inspired by L. de Broglie and by the brief but infinitely far-seeking remarks of A. Einstein. I was absolutely unaware of any generic relationship with Heisenberg. I naturally knew about his theory, but because of the very difficult appearing methods of transcendental algebra and because of the lack of visualizability, I felt deterred by it, if not to say repelled. Unquote. Take a note of that last word, repelled. It's a really, really strong word, especially for the usually reserved and professional language of scientific communication in journal publication. However, it summed up the feeling of a lot of physicists who weren't working in the sphere of influence of the copenhagen gottingen group, led by Bohr and Born. On the other side, Heisenberg wasn't willing to give an inch to Schrodinger. He felt that wave mechanics represented a step backwards, to talking about things that weren't observable. Schrodinger had used something he called the psi function that represented a sort of ghost field to use the term Einstein had coined, or something maybe more like a guiding hand to steer the electron in its path around the nucleus. To Heisenberg, this was just invoking a sort of convenient fiction to explain things Schrodinger didn't actually know the first thing about. We now call this the wave function, but Heisenberg wanted to know, could one actually observe this quote-unquote guiding hand? Could it be measured somehow? If so, great, do that, he said. But if not, let's stop talking about it and get back to the stuff we can actually measure. Things like transitions and quantum jumps that can be determined by the spectra produced by various elements. By May of 1926, the positions were pretty clearly staked out though de Broglie would add a third model late in that year by continuing to develop his ideas, something that would only contribute to the state of crisis that would last about another 18 months. To get a sense of the tension, one only has to look at the series of events in the summer of 1926. After his publication of Wave Mechanics, Schrödinger was selected to replace the retiring Max Planck at the University of Berlin. It was an exceptionally prestigious appointment, one that cemented Schrodinger's standing in the world of physics. Just prior to Schrodinger's appointment, Heisenberg had given a series of lectures to the faculty there in Berlin that had not gone particularly well. The complexity of the presentations had baffled the senior researchers there. When Schrodinger traveled to give a series of lectures to the same audience just three months later in preparation for his arrival, he explained his approach and he was met with a much more enthusiastic reception. As Gino Segre puts it, quote, he, meaning Schrodinger, was one of their own, not a 24-year-old boy challenging and confounding his elders, unquote. I think it's easy sometimes to forget in all of this just how young Heisenberg actually was at this point. About 24, like Segre says, basically still something of a scientific nomad, an apprentice almost, or a journeyman, still lacking a permanent scientific appointment. Now, the two scientists' paths would cross a short time later in Munich. Schrodinger was returning to Zurich after the lectures in Berlin to gather his things to move, and he stopped in Munich to lecture at the university there. Heisenberg, whose parents lived in Munich, was visiting the city and decided to attend the lecture. At the end of Schrodinger's presentation, Heisenberg rose to challenge the man's use of unobservable quantities. As he began his question, a longtime member of the Berlin faculty cut Heisenberg off and said, quote, Young man, Professor Schrodinger will certainly take care of all of these questions in due time. You must understand we are now finished with all that nonsense about quantum jumps. Unquote. Ouch. The stinging rebuke showed Heisenberg just what much of the physics community outside of the small bubble he was working with thought of what was coming out of that bubble. Now, at about that same time, though, Max Born published a paper trying to build something of a bridge between the two approaches. 
he was able to show that the psi function was indeed completely unobservable. However, if one squared the function and took its magnitude, that quantity represented the probability of finding the electron at a specific position, something that was, at least in principle, observable. What this meant was that there was no possibility of determining the electron's absolute position, just the relative probability of finding it in one place or another. Born would receive the Nobel Prize in 1956 for this work, but it struck many as something along the lines of Solomon splitting the baby. Einstein especially was horrified by the prospect that the paper implied that on the scale of the very small, physics would have to abandon the notion of causality. He would write Born, quote, Quantum mechanics is very impressive, but an inner voice tells me that it is not yet the real thing. The theory produces a good deal, but it hardly brings us closer to the secrets of the old one. I am, at all events, convinced that he does not play dice. A note here is in probably in order about this rather famous quote from Einstein and his spirituality. I think it would be a mistake to place Einstein within a religious context such as the Judeo-Christian tradition. While certainly a monotheist as evidenced by the quote, Einstein's God was very much along the lines of an earlier Jewish scientist philosopher by the name of Baruch Spinoza. Spinoza's thought of the divine was not so much as a person, but as a rational organizing principle made creatively active. As the crisis developed, Heisenberg moved to take the position of chief assistant to Bohr in Copenhagen. This move allowed the two men to interact on a daily basis and begin formulating a response to the growing ascendancy of wave mechanics. With Pauli and Hamburg to provide a critically needed skeptical review of the theories coming out of Bohr's Institute, there was a serious chance they would be able to put forward a form of their ideas that solved a number of problems. In October of 1926, Schrodinger accepted an invitation to come and spend some time presenting his ideas much as he had done at Berlin and Munich. However, far from the supportive environments of those two institutions, the reception was far more critical, most especially from Bohr. The two grappled with and over Schrodinger's ideas, especially the physical meaning of the psi function as a wave description. Bohr was relentless in his pressing of Schrodinger to define what each thing actually was and how he knew that. The visit was so exhausting that Schrodinger ended up taking ill, and even there he was not safe from Bohr's questions. Neither man changed the other's mind, however, and when Schrodinger left, things were much as they had been, though both had a much deeper appreciation of the other's abilities and intellectual courage and honesty. Bohr also had a much better understanding of Schrodinger's ideas and their limitations. After Schrodinger left Copenhagen, the group there began to really wrestle to pin down the problems they had with wave mechanics. What it all seemed to boil down to, and I am significantly simplifying this, was measurement. The group wanted to know what could and couldn't be measured, at least in principle. Could one measure the spatial variables of an electron in an atom? Wave mechanics wanted to say yes, but what Bohr had learned with Schrodinger's visit was that the answer was probably actually no. As the discussions progressed, two things emerged. The first centered around a specific part of matrix mechanics. Both Heisenberg and Dirac had shown that the product of the position and the momentum was not commutative, but neither was exactly sure what that really meant physically. The second was that Bohr was beginning to move towards a philosophical position that seemed to favor both a wave and particle nature of matter, something Heisenberg was initially deeply opposed to. Over the course of the next few months, the two men began to argue about the answers to these questions, and the arguments became, at time, heated and intense. What you had were two strong-willed men who had views about the details of this work that differed. Both were unrelenting 
and in February, the relationship between them had become severely strained. They both needed a time to think apart from each other, and so Bohr took an extended skiing holiday that was supposed to be a break from the work, but ended up being spent continuing to struggle with it without much success. After Bohr left, though, Heisenberg managed to hit on what the non-commutivity meant physically. The fact that the order of multiplication mattered said that there were limits to how accurately one could measure both the position of an object and its momentum. The relationship that grew out of this idea is now called Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle, but we need to be careful with that name. In a way of illustrating this, let me share with you a joke I sometimes make with my students about what I refer to as the Uncertainty Principle of Life. What I tell them is, if you know where you are, you probably don't know where you're going. And if you know where you're going in life, probably you don't know where you are. This sort of statement suggests that you can only know one thing or the other, or that there's some sort of built-in cluelessness in the universe. That's really not what Heisenberg is getting at, though it may in fact actually be true. What he was saying was that you could measure both quantities, but only to a certain accuracy. Attempts to measure one of the quantities to a higher level accuracy would change the other quantity in such a way that, would, that you would know less about the value of that specific quantity. The uncertainty principle says that the product of the uncertainty in both measurements, the position and the momentum, cannot be smaller than the Planck constant, which is about 6 times 10 to the negative 34th power. A very small number for sure, but still not zero. For example, if one wanted to measure the position of an electron, one could do so, but she would have to have something else interact with the electron and then get collected to make the measurement. Think of bouncing a photon from a light source off the electron and then collecting it with a microscope. While the photon can determine the position of the electron precisely, the fact that it collides with the electron changes the electron's speed and thus its momentum. And it does so in a way that creates uncertainty. We know where the photon hit the electron, but now we don't know where the electron's going because, well, it's collided with that photon. This was something that wave mechanics just couldn't account for. In fact, its inability to handle the scattering of light by matter well was the biggest failure of that approach in a mathematical sense. Now, when Bohr returned from his working vacation, Heisenberg had written up a pretty good paper about the topic, had it checked by Pauli, and he wanted to send it off. While the director of the institute was impressed with the work and thought it very important, he counseled against publication, as the paper didn't seem to address the wave-particle issue that he was interested in. Bohr really wanted one paper that cleaned up the entire landscape, while Heisenberg wanted to get his idea out there to counter the rising tide of wave mechanics. Once again, the two took to arguing, and it looked like the whole enterprise might come apart at the seams. Of this time, Heisenberg remembered. Bohr tried to explain that it was not right, and that I shouldn't publish the paper. I remember that in it, my breaking out in tears because I just couldn't stand the pressure from Bohr." Unquote. Heisenberg did resist, however, and the paper was submitted in March of 1927. While Bohr disagreed, he admired Heisenberg sticking to his guns, saying later to his biographer that no good scientist should ever be talked out of something he was truly convinced to be true. It wasn't until after this in 1927 that things began to cool down between the two men. Pauli had arrived at the Institute, and he managed to get them to stop talking past each other. They quickly realized that the issue was only one of how to move forward in the research program, and not anything more than that. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle was sound, and there were just a few details to work out, at least that's what they thought, with what would become known as Bohr's complementarity principle. Now, before we move on, there's one final thing we should say about the uncertainty principle, and that is it meant the death of what we call future-looking causality. It's said that if we can't know the present state of something with arbitrary accuracy, we can't 
predict its future behavior with absolute certainty. Of this, Heisenberg wrote, quote, In the Sharp formulation of the causality law, if we know the present, then we can predict the future. It is not the consequence, but the premise that is false. As a matter of principle, we cannot know all the determining elements of the present, unquote. What this also meant was that the act of making a measurement on a system of small scale changed the system. This is what had bothered Bohr so much in the arguments between the new two men. He felt that Heisenberg hadn't given this fundamental altering of the system by mere measurement enough thought. Pauli convinced him that such a resolution was unnecessary to move forward with putting the uncertainty principle out there for other researchers to think about. However, it could be used to think more carefully about the role in measurement in determining the nature of light and matter. What Bohr was rapidly coming to the conclusion of was that maybe we didn't actually have a firm grasp of wave-particle duality. What he realized was that when you tried to measure light or matter looking for wave properties, you found them. And when you tried to measure them looking for particle properties, you found those as well. When Heisenberg tried to solve the problems with the old quantum model using particle methods, he was able to do that. When Schrodinger tried using wave methods, he could do that as well. When you looked at it closely, it turned out even that both methods were equivalent. What this might mean was that light and matter were both particles and waves. But that was pretty unphysical to think about. It was like saying something was both a bullet localized in one place and a wiggle spread out along a rope. And that's kind of counterintuitive. Another interpretation might be that these things, matter and light, have both sets of properties in some way. And that the process of measuring the electron or photon forced it to display that specific type of behavior you were trying to measure. A third interpretation could be that light and electrons are neither of these things, neither wave or particle, but that the measurement made them show the properties or became that property. Throughout 1927, Bohr struggled with these ideas. One of the problems was that he was so careful to qualify and couch his terminology that his ideas became a, a hopeless morass to wade through. When he attended a conference in Cuomo, Italy in the late summer of 1927, his presentation of the topic of wave-particle duality was so poorly received that he withdrew a short note he had submitted to the journal Nature on the topic. Nevertheless, he kept working at it, and by October of that year, he thought he had it fairly well expressed. The reason this date is so important, of course, was that it was when the Solvay Conference would be held. The Solvay Conferences had first been organized by the Belgian industrialist Ernest Solvay to discuss important work in physics and chemistry. Each discipline was to hold a gathering of the preeminent individuals doing work in a subject area of the organizer's choosing. The first physics conference had been held in 1911, and though the intention had been to have one follow every two or three years, World War I stopped that after 1913. Once the conference was restarted after the conflict had ended, German scientists were excluded from the next two because Germany had sort of invaded Belgium. It wasn't until the fifth conference that all of the major players could be invited again. For this gathering, Hendrik Lorentz had chosen electrons and photons as the topic which allowed for invitations to be sent to all of the major players in the debate that we've been talking about. The format of the conference was very formal, with presentations on ideas given in a lecture setting, with questions only allowed at the end, and the discussion being held in a very structured fashion during most of the sessions. For this reason, most of the real conversation of what was being considered happened at the meals, in the hallways, and in the hotel rooms after the various talks. Over the course of the week, a limited consensus began to emerge among the 29 participants. While those strongly committed to wave mechanics were not really swayed by the conversations and the presentations of the conference, 
most of the rest of the group began to see that the interpretation of the group in Copenhagen seemed to offer the best description of what was happening. So what was this Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory? It rested on two ideas, the uncertainty principle and the complementarity principle. As we talked extensively about the first, let's focus on the second. For Bohr, what this meant was that the way in which you made a measurement determined, in part, the type of outcome you measured. In his words, quote, however far the phenomena transcend the scope of classical physical explanation, the account of all evidence must be expressed in classical terms. The argument is simply that by the word experiment, we refer to a situation where we can tell others what we have done and what we have learned and that, therefore, the account of the experimental arrangements and of the results of the observations must be expressed in unambiguous language with suitable application of the terminology of classical physics. This crucial point implies the impossibility of any sharp separation between the behavior of atomic objects and the interaction with the measuring instruments which serve to define the conditions under which the phenomena appear. Consequently, evidence obtained under different experimental conditions cannot be comprehended within a single picture, but must be regarded as complementary in the sense that only the totality of the phenomena exhausts the possible information about the objects." Unquote. In other words, Bohr was saying that he couldn't say whether an electron or a photon was a particle or a wave, or both or neither. All he could say was that when a scientist measured it one way, she might see particle behavior, but when using a different technique, she could, might see, could see, wave behavior. However, no matter how hard she tried, she wouldn't be able to see both types of behavior at the same time. Thus, the only way to understand the electron or photon was to see all of the possible behaviors and say that each thing displays each behavior in the right condition. As much as Einstein and Schrodinger tried to break the Copenhagen interpretation at the Solvay meeting, they were unable to find a flaw, either in terms of the physical reasoning or philosophically. While they might not like it, or what it implied, they could not refute it. In fact, Einstein would spend a significant amount of time following the conference, trying to break it, and his letters to Bohr on the topic, along with Bohr's responses, are a wonderful insight into the minds of two of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century. In Heisenberg's mind, the Copenhagen interpretation resolved quantum mechanics completely. And with the hindsight afforded by historical perspective, he was more right than wrong about that. There was still work to be done in hashing out the details, but the philosophical issues were more or less settled. At the fifth Solvay conference, the future path of physics was decided along with our understanding of the nature and behavior of matter. No longer were light waves and electrons particles. Quantum leaps and discontinuous behaviors were now enshrined in the mathematics that explain spectra. Strict causality, a fundamental cornerstone of classical physics, was violated. While the classical picture developed by Newton and Maxwell worked on the scale of everyday experience, this was shown to be a statistical average of the microscopically uncertain behaviors of the subatomic particles that made up all of those everyday things. All of this was a fundamental break with the classical worldview that physicists have been trying to hang on to since Bohr first suggested the old quantum atom back in 1913. In our next episode, I'd like to take just a little bit of time away from the narrative to look at the lives of the various participants in the Solvay conference, most notably Heisenberg, Pauli, Schrodinger, and Dirac. They were a diverse group of brilliant scientists who shared the preferences and foibles found throughout humanity. So until next time, full sails on your journey.